Jurassic Park holds a special place in my heart, and even with nostalgia aside, I think it's a good film. The sequels? Not so much. And Jurassic World? That's a movie I hate. I wanted to be excited when it was announced. I love dinosaurs. I wanted to be crying in happiness that finally, finally the messiah of dinosaur-based entertainment had arrived. But Jurassic World was no such thing. Before the film released, I was very disappointed with its design choices and general disregard for a semblance of scientific accuracy. I thought it was a major setback for the franchise as a whole. Back then, I made a video about this subject matter, but it was an improvised rant recorded on a potato that I've since deleted. However, that old video did have plenty of salvageable content, and I've reincorporated that content into this new, reworked, and upgraded video. Since Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is on the verge of coming out in theaters, the timing seems apt. To everybody trigger-happy with the knee-jerk response of, the dinosaurs are not meant to be realistic, the movie says so itself. Yes, I am well aware. Nothing in Jurassic World is natural. We have always filled gaps in the genome with the DNA of other animals, and if their genetic code was pure, many of them would look quite different, but you didn't ask for reality. Can I just go on a quick tangent to remind everyone that Hollywood has never learned what the genetic code actually is. The genetic code governs which sequence of nucleotide triplets results in which amino acid during protein synthesis. It's a guide to what proteins you'll get from genetic material. It is not synonymous for the word genome. Sorry, I can't help myself. This error just pops up everywhere. It's in Jurassic Park 1 as well. Anyway, the excuse that the animals were not designed to be realistic in-universe is besides the point. I'm not particularly interested in critiquing the in-universe logic that's at play in the Jurassic series, although of course one could do plenty of that. I mean, going all the way back to the first Jurassic Park, they used frog DNA to fill in gaps. Birds are phylogenetically dinosaurs, but if they're not going to use birds, crocodilians and dinosaurs are at least both archosaurs, and if not that, at least pick a lizard or something, keep it within reptilia. There's a plethora of things to be nitpicky about within the confines of the film, but I want to frame the discussion around creative decisions that went into the production of the film. The decision, the intent, to have your dinosaurs and other revived animals be amalgamations and not true to what we know. I want to be looking at the big picture here, not ad hoc justifications for inaccuracies. Although, that being said, how utterly convenient that many of the inaccuracies we held as common knowledge decades ago happen to be the specific ones to manifest from having incomplete and altered DNA samples. Hmm, it's almost like they're constructing a scapegoat to justify lazy and poorly researched designs or something. I've got one final bit of prelude I want to cover before we transition into the primary topic of creative choices and scientific accuracy. I just wanted to be clear that I don't hate Jurassic World because its animals happen to be unrealistic. The overall plot and characters are plenty terrible enough on their own. If Jurassic World was super accurate in regards to what we currently know about extinct animals, my thoughts would still be... That is one big pile of shit. However, and I find this rather interesting, making the animals scientifically accurate would in fact lead to some scenes not being able to exist, or at least mandate that they be heavily modified. This does not relate just to appearance and anatomy, but also the manner in which the animals featured don't behave like real animals, but rather mindless agents of destruction with no sense of self-preservation. Let's take a look at the pterosaur material in Jurassic World. So the Indominus Rex breaks open the aviary where the pterosaurs are kept, they fly out, and what's the first thing they do with their newly acquired freedom? They swarm the nearby helicopter. Why would they purposefully go out of their way to launch themselves face first into this big machine in the sky that would cause serious harm and potentially death if they impact into it? Because the script mandates it, I laughed so hard. The pterosaurs are apparently hyper-rabid animals that may as well have been infected by the rage virus from 28 Days Later. I feel like in the aviary, they would just be bashing themselves against the glass until they break their own necks when the humans come by to look at them. Out of all the Jurassic World exhibits, the pterosaurs are treated like a living, breathing animal the least. 
And of course, they target all the visitors next and try to carry them away, because I guess they've been starved by the staff or something. It's the most obvious schlocky trite. Even the ones that are fairly small and would have no chance trying to kill a human far larger than them are in on the action. It's a damn shame that Dimorphodon, which is a really cool and interesting looking pterosaur, is only allowed to exist so it can bite at Chris Pratt's face. Actual Dimorphodons have a wingspan of only 1.5 meters, 5 feet, and are estimated to weigh only about 5 pounds or 2.2 kilograms. This one is about twice that size, but still. Chris Pratt here is essentially failing a test of strength with a pelican. It's interesting how the Jurassic World website doubles Dimorphodon's length but keeps its weight the same, although it's even more comical if Chris Pratt, with all his toned muscles, can't manage to lift four pounds off his chest. And while Dimorphodon's got some nasty looking teeth, the bite force and tooth penetration would have been low due to weak jaw musculature. Dimorphodon was thought to feed on proportionally small prey items. He might end up bleeding a bit, but Chris Pratt's not actually in all that much danger here. By the way, only the first several teeth were large, with the rest being small. They seem to miss this little detail in Jurassic World, which I have to say is really sad because the pterosaur's name is Dimorphodon. Die, two, morph, form, don, tooth. Two types of teeth. Just fuck my life. They actually include this on the Jurassic World website, despite the design not having the two types of teeth. Dimorphodon's role in Jurassic World is silly, but I think it's topped by this bit right here. I laughed my ass off at this scene. We're treating this pteranodon like some kind of crashing fighter jet instead of an animal made of bone and flesh. Pterosaurs have to be incredibly lightweight to be able to fly. Even if we use the highest estimates, a pteranodon this size would still be under 100 kilos. Its wings would not be able to break through the structures on the side of the building like this, unless that building is made out of paper mache. The bones would break, the wing would snap, the pteranodon would be stopped. But the script demands a jump away from the explosion styled scene, so we get this, entirely ignoring anatomy and physics to the maximum. Speaking of ignoring physics, one of the pteranodons picks up a baby ceratopsid, which is surely multiple times heavier than it is. At this point, I should probably also mention that real pterosaurs can't grab things with their feet. That's right. Pterosaurs can't do the whole bird of prey thing, their feet don't work like that. If the film actually wanted to keep a semblance of accuracy and realism, the entirety of the pterosaur stuff would have to be scrapped. Scrapped, thrown in the dumpster, and set on fire. Oh, and as this Mark Whitten interview I featured earlier states, even the basic anatomy of these creatures when it comes to physical appearance was handled poorly. Let me lay this on you, there is a magic treehouse anime that has a better depiction of a pterosaur than does Jurassic World. In this anime, one of the kids has to hang on to the foot of the pterosaur rather than it grabbing him and lifting him on its own, because the creators behind it actually seemed to care and did a little bit of research. Wanna know of another anime that had a better pterosaur? There's this soccer anime called Inazuma 11, and in one iteration of it, there's an as dark a pterosaur who's a coach. Now, I have no idea how a pterosaur is supposed to coach a sports team, but regardless, this particular as darkid happens to be anatomically in line with what science tells us the world is like, more so than the pterosaurs in Jurassic World. Yeah. Jurassic World, in general, doesn't like the concept of physics. I'm willing to bet money that in Fallen Kingdom, there's going to be some extra stupid stuff with lava, and I hope I don't need to tell anybody that there's no way they would survive a pyroclastic flow, as we saw in the trailer. Chris Pratt has got to be a literal superhero for the island exploding narrative to have an ounce of believability. While the first world film didn't have quite as much over-the-top action and explosions, Although, 
yeah, there was still a lot. The first Jurassic World did have a major case of ignoring the fact that its battling beasties were supposed to be made of flesh and bone. One moment in particular that I know took a lot of dinosaur fans out of the film was when the Indominus Rex receives a direct blow from the club of an Ankylosaur and simply shrugs it off as if nothing happened. I don't care what sort of justification akin to it's a super powerful genetic hybrid people come up with. The Indominus is clearly lacking sufficient external armor plating to receive that massive of a blow and not be dead. It doesn't even so much as act injured as a consequence of this confrontation for the remainder of the film. For me, moments like these just kill tension and immersion. They remove the feeling of consequence, of cause and effect, and they ruin dinosaur on dinosaur interactions. It's the reason why I got close to no enjoyment out of the finale where Tyrannosaurus Rex battles the Indominus. These giant animals feel like they have practically no mass to them. There's no impact or meaning to any action they do. Every bite, every push feels so empty and nearly pointless. It's like, okay, you got bit by a T-Rex. An animal with an immense level of bite force, may I add. Right on the neck. It's fine, tis but a flesh wound. Get right back in there, Indominus. What's that, Tyrannosaurus? The Indominus swung you into the ground in a way that should break your hip, and then bit your neck and surely broke your neck as well? You're good. Get back in there. Then we repeat this again. And again. And again. And again, we just keep having these 10 to 15 ton animals getting tossed around by their necks with no consequence. Am I supposed to be watching 15 meter behemoths duke it out? Because it feels more like I'm watching 15 centimeter anole lizards. The choreography in The Big Showdown lacks any sense of realism and proper sense of scale. It's literally mindless action on the level of the Transformers movies. As a quick aside, I do find it a bit amusing how Jurassic World is infatuated with upping the sizes of its creatures. Like, the Mosasaur could have still dragged the Indominus into its lagoon without needing to be gigantic. And in Fallen Kingdom, its size appears to be ludicrous. It's at the minimum five times longer than the largest ones ever were. Also, I can't help it, I just have to point out a stupid little detail when the Mosasaur grabs Indominus. My mind went wild when I first noticed it. This barricade is meant for people to be next to so they can look at the Mosasaur Lagoon. There's a dining table and an umbrella right next to it, as well as an information panel. Clearly, visitors are meant to have access to this area. The barrier is broken by Indominus being pushed into it, then the Mosasaur breaches super high into the air and drags Indominus down into the lagoon. You know what I'm getting at here, right? If there's people constantly around this barrier during the park's operation, and the barrier can easily be busted by something multiple times smaller than the Mosasaur, and if all these animals are apparently hyper-aggressive and love murdering anything within reach, then how has the Mosasaur not previously breached and busted through this barrier with its gargantuan body to grab a mouthful of visitors for a quick snack? That seems like a major safety hazard you've overlooked there, Jurassic World staff. Anyway, that was just a dumb little aside, please excuse my tangent. Now, finally, onto a topic that's sure to ruffle some feathers. Uh, yep, feathered dinosaurs. It's only a matter of time before feathered theropods become mainstream, because in the long run, you can't really fight against a fact. Feathered theropods were actually a known thing back when Jurassic Park 1 came out, but it wasn't as ubiquitously accepted as it is now. We now have much more evidence of dino fuzz across various groups, and while keeping theropods scaly in JP1 was unfortunate but arguably acceptable, doing it in the modern day is simply an act of willful disregard. The direction Jurassic World took is a shame when Jurassic Park went in pretty hard on comparing non-avian dinosaurs to birds. And look at the half-moon-shaped bones on the wrist. It's not one of these guys learn how to fly. Look at the pubic bone. Turned backward, just like a bird. Look at the vertebrae, full of air sacs and hollows, just like a bird. The whole six-foot turkey exchange was pretty iconic. The point is, you are alive when they start to eat you. So, you know, try to show a little respect. Okay.
On a similar note, I love this XKCD comic about how utterly subjective something being awesome can be. An adult reminisces about how dinosaurs used to be awesome, but now they all have dorky feathers, right? And the kid responds with, Yup, this says they now think raptors use their wings for stability, flapping to stay on top of their prey while hanging on with their hooked claws and eating it alive. In response, the adult sits down and grabs a book to learn more about dinosaurs. A feathered dinosaur can be as dorky, or awesome, or scary, or as goofy as you want to make it. Personally, I think feathers allow for far more design choices and creativity when designing dinos, and using real scientific speculation to craft your ideas can lead to new and interesting moments for the audience to witness. If you want a dinosaur to be scary, the manner in which it threatens the cast and how much tension its presence causes is far more important than how it actually looks. There's a reason clowns can be made scary even if their appearance is intended to be somewhat goofy. As Dr. Grant said though, when something is capable of killing you and eating you alive, you should probably show it some respect. Have a raptor pull its head out of the belly of a carcass, and feathered or not, it can be quite frightening. Modern day birds which feast on corpses, reaching their heads deep into the viscera, they already look pretty damn scary. Just take a look at this petrel that was feasting on a seal carcass. If one of these was the height of a human, and you throw some teeth and claws onto it, that's some decent potential nightmare fuel right there. If you want scary theropods, having them be feathered should not pose you any problems. One of my personal favorite ideas I've seen out there has got to be this one. Raptors that are capable of mimicking human speech like some modern day birds do. So when they escape and wander through the park, they creepily repeat phrases they've commonly heard said around their pens while they were in captivity. I'm in love with this as a concept, and it would be the coolest thing to see it on the big screen. Jurassic Park does not have to turn into this to be in line with scientific thinking, unless you purposefully want a cheesy and campy adventure. Which, personally, I would also love that. It's possible many dinosaurs did look silly, poofy, and cute, and a film that flexes its funny bone for the dinosaur design would be a breath of fresh air in a movie climate where every animal is mandated to be a mindless killing machine. Even if we're going to mandate menacing predators, I still think Jurassic World missed a great opportunity to bring something fresh and new for its audience. As one example of countless to draw inspiration from, take a look at the bearded vulture, one of my favorite birds, and bask in its majesty and beauty. I would absolutely love a theropod dinosaur design inspired by this awesome bird. Jurassic World takes the raptors from the first film and pretty much emulates them whole hog. The only major addition was giving the raptor named Blue a racing stripe to differentiate it, a move of creativity on par with that of Homer Simpson. Well, basically, I just copied the plant we have now. Hmm. Then, I added some fins to lower wind resistance, and this racing stripe here I feel is pretty sharp. And, oh boy, the Indominus Rex. I find the Indominus so bland and boring, and the dark-colored smaller Indoraptor for Fallen Kingdom is not much better. You have the potential to make a genetic hybrid, and you just settle for your typical Allosaurus-like design with weird arms? Why? It's rather comical that the Indominus actually resembles Rudy the Baronix from Ice Age Dawn of the Dinosaurs, a film that came out back in 2009. Except for the snout shape, it's rather uncanny just how close the similarity is, and I think it goes a ways to show the creative bankruptcy when it comes to dinosaurs in big budget films. The disappointment felt by the lack of creativity in the Indominus design actually led to the creation of the Build a Better Fake Theropod hashtag online, which was a fun little movement that asked for people to draw pictures of fake theropods they created. I'm only featuring four designs here that I was personally fond of, but there's plenty more out there. Go look at them if you're interested. It's a damn shame when a movie with six digits in its budget can't even craft a fake theropod that appears interesting. Even the Pokemon series has thrown some dino fuzz onto Tyrantrum to spice up the usual reptilian designs they've gone with in the past to be a bit more unique and distinct. And then there's this big butte in the game Monster Hunter World called Anjanath. 
I absolutely adore this monster. This is the sort of fake theropod I would actually want to see in a feature film. Its design is clearly vulture inspired, and I adore the way that the feathers were placed on the body. It reminds me of the minimal feathering I've seen given to T-Rex in some paleo art. It's actually not too far off from the feathering given to T-Rex in the realistic dino simulator game Saurian, although obviously Anjanath has more of its body exposed. As if this thing wasn't cool enough. When it becomes enraged, it has a nasal crest structure that inflates on its face, as well as sail-like vestigial wings prop open on its back. We're not gonna get into the supposed evolution of Monster Hunter creatures, but one thing is clear, this thing is flippin' awesome, and I would much rather have a beast like this run about in Jurassic World than the Indominus Rex. At the end of the day, yes, Jurassic World is merely a movie, but you'd be surprised just how much of an influence it can have. I've seen plenty of educators and consultants express disappointment at just how much the Jurassic series has framed the layperson's perspective of what dinosaurs are like. One of the most common misconceptions has got to be making theropod palms face downward. Theropods lack the ability to pronate their hands, so they should face inwards. Jurassic World has chosen to maintain this improper hand orientation all the way into the modern day, and Fallen Kingdom has even plastered this incorrect hand posture as promotional material. And even if this wasn't anatomically inaccurate, I personally think this image looks super goofy rather than scary. I remember when I first saw a trailer for Fallen Kingdom Online, it was one of those that had a 5 second hook before the full trailer starts. God, I hate those. But that 5 second hook was of this scene, and I legit thought I had clicked on a parody video. I've been putting Jurassic World on blast. And I'm sure it seems like I've held Jurassic Park 1 up on a pedestal, but I'm not forgetting that JP1 was also chock full of inaccuracies. As everyone knows, Velociraptors were quite small and it would make far more sense to call the creatures in the film Deinonychus. And the Dilophosaurus was an abomination when it comes to accuracy. But despite all the dumb stuff in JP1, what that film still did a stellar job with was treating its subject material as if they were actual, realized animals. The part of the film where the T-Rex escapes from its enclosure still blows me away to this day, even though lots of elements during the experience are silly. Tyrannosaurus vision being based on movement is a bogus notion. The T-Rex had fantastic vision, and even then it should be plenty capable of smelling the humans at point-blank range. I find injecting drama in this manner unnecessary, and it sets a bad precedent for future films that draw inspiration from moments like these. Seriously, there are so many films that use the it can't see you if you don't move trope. The most recent I can think of would be Annihilation, where the monster bear hellbent on killing the main characters decides not to attack for some reason when the humans remain still. I should mention that in real life, playing dead is a tactic that may work against the defensive bear, but it's not a tactic that works on predatory bears. They're gonna eviscerate you regardless. I place a lot of blame on Jurassic Park 1 for being a big contributor to spreading this trope throughout popular culture to the point where most people don't even bother questioning the logic to it anymore. And yet, and yet, despite these criticisms, I still love the encounter because the T-Rex is treated like a real, living, breathing animal that thinks and behaves like an actual animal would. The T-Rex doesn't charge and smash everything in its path when seeing the beam of a flashlight. It casually walks over with its interest peaked, taking its time to observe. The scene has as much visceral tension as it does, specifically because the T-Rex isn't doing much of anything for the first portion of it. It's the weight of anticipation, knowing your life rests on the whim of a curious animal. When the T-Rex finally confirms there's something moving around inside the car, it doesn't immediately try to bust it open, it gives it a slight shove first. And then after it flips the car, then it tries taste testing various bits of the underside because it doesn't know what this object is. It's a gradual, methodical examination carried out by a curious predator, rather than an agent of destruction hellbent on smashing everything in its path. I also adore how Rexy is committed to stripping the tire off the wheel, because animals often do get preoccupied with menial tasks like these. I feel like anybody who's owned a pet can relate a lot to the way the T-Rex plays around with its surroundings. It's not as if the original Jurassic Park was devoid of things to criticize, far from it. 
It's simply that the genuine feeling of wonder Jurassic Park manages to elicit is lost in Jurassic World. And instead of building on the grandeur of the original, the Jurassic World franchise has chosen to descend into mindless action blockbuster drivel. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom wants to try to remind us of the wonder of the first film. It wants to hark back to those emotions to promote itself. Do you remember the first time you saw a dinosaur? But really, how can I take its appeal to emotion seriously when there's scenes like these? The producers behind the world franchise are still trying to push the product as something inspiring. For kids who grow up loving dinosaurs, the Jurassic movies are really the vehicle for them to see their dreams realized. See, that's the thing. That's not true. The first Jurassic Park definitely was, but to claim Jurassic World follows in those footsteps is farcical. I am happy that Fallen Kingdom has relied more extensively on animatronics, and I appreciate that at least parts of the film are trying to be more visually stylistic. I found the cinematography in Jurassic World seriously lacking, so having some Bloodborne-esque scenes like these that ooze style is nice. But Fallen Kingdom still looks to be an explosion-laden action-adventure romp with lukewarm horror elements. It's a typical summer blockbuster that people will tell you to turn your brain off for and enjoy. It's not a vehicle for realizing dreams. In the end, it comes down to this. Jurassic World feels like a very lazy and uninspired take on your average Hollywood blockbuster. Scientific accuracy does not have to be incorporated into every little detail of every film, but if you're portraying things that actually existed, it would be nice if some effort was taken. Incorporating science with creativity often makes the project a lot more interesting, and Jurassic World could have greatly benefited from using scientific knowledge as its foundation. But alas, Jurassic World made money, and Fallen Kingdom will also make money. So we're in for more of the same.